Hi, everybody. It's great to be here with you all to talk about moral injury, and it's absolutely fine that no one in this room has ever heard of it. There is a bit of a PR problem, I'm going to admit that, but we are making a giant dent in the PR problem right now. I'm very happy you're all here. So a moral injury is a kind of identity wound. It brutalizes a person's core sense of self and self-esteem and can lead to lifelong debilitating psychiatric symptoms. Moral injuries happen when an important cultural moral norm is betrayed and it hurts your feelings so bad that it changes your brain and your behavior. It changes your brain in two ways. First, your brain loses its capacity to trust that your culture is going to ad adhere to its moral norms, and your brain also loses its capacity to trust that you are going to adhere to your own moral norms. This kind of injury reveals an insidious truth, which is that good, seemingly stable adult character is in fact maintained or perhaps even constituted by a culture's adherence to its moral norms. Without the ability to rely on the fact that your culture is going to adhere to its norms, you uh, can lose yourself, you can become unrecognizable. Some of the things that happen in that state are inc include uh, a catastrophic loss of moral reasoning. Moral injuries lead to people feeling chronically guilty, angry, ashamed, and anxious. These folks can't sleep very well, and they often crave isolation. But these are really just the broad strokes. This is the what a moral injury is, what it has the capacity to do to a person, but really and truly what can cause this sort of identity wound. A moral injury is caused by three things. All of them are required. The first is a betrayal of what's right by a person in a position of authority, in a high stakes situation. So I'll say them all again. A betrayal of what's right by a person in a position of authority in a high stakes situation. You'll see what's right is always presented in quotation marks and that's to indicate that the moral norm being betrayed is culturally specific. So it'll be dependent on the context. It'll change over time depending on where you are and the environment in which you find yourself. Moral injury was coined in 1990, <laughs> cue the embarrassing photo. Uh, <laughs> moral injury was coined in 1994 by neuropathologist and psychiatrist, Dr. Jonathan Shea. Moral injury often gets confused with two of its older cousins. It was created a decade after nursing scholar Andrew Jamitin first identified the concept of moral distress and six years after psychiatry formally recognized post-traumatic stress disorder. Moral distress focuses on the, the angst that a person feels when they know, they know the right thing to do, but they can't do it because of external forces. PTSD is best understood as a kind of extreme anxiety stemming from a traumatic event that continues to surface regardless of a person's current safety. Moral injury, on the other hand, is about living with the rage and the shame that come from acting in a manner without any worry about right and wrong. Because neither moral distress nor PTSD captured the elements of experience that Jonathan Shea saw in the veteran population with whom he was working, moral injury was born. Although moral injury is not a formally recognized psychiatric condition, it has been taken up as a concept in many disciplines outside of medicine, including those in the humanities and the social sciences. Because it's been embraced so widely, New adaptations have been developed over time. Unfortunately, a particular aspect of Shea's work has gone almost universally ignored in these new adaptations. What is missing is called the berserk state. When a person experiences a moral injury, they may enter into a godlike state where they experience a complete moral and mental collapse. It is in the berserk state 
that moral injury becomes the empathy killer. The actions of the berserker lead to hallmark conditions of moral injury, shame, guilt, leftover rage about the situation. Without a proper understanding of what it means to go berserk, we're not going to fully comprehend moral injury. And that's problematic because moral injury has the potential to ruin good character in a matter of seconds. I'll give you an example, but first a little background. We're now 20 months deep in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. This global contagion has killed close to 3,000 health workers in the United States. The World Health Organization puts that number north of 100,000 globally. At least 3,000 health workers have left their jobs in hospitals or left their careers altogether because of how different their work has become in light of this virus. Many of these providers have been working in COVID units solidly for a year and a half now. A lot of these folks are people who came into medicine because of some commitment to a moral norm. Maybe it was uh, the noble goal of caring for the sick and suffering or a desire to contribute to the greater good. These are sustaining norms that help health workers face the lethal dangers that mark their everyday professional tasks. Their training provides them support against known threats, and then tools such as masks, gowns, and gloves provide an essential level of personal protection. The danger of the virus and the conditions of scarcity around those items created a distribution of risk that was unsafe for health workers. They responded by relocating to hotel rooms to protect their families from being infected, but there was very little to be done back at the hospital in the face of patients who had refractory COVID pneumonia. Still the case now. As these conditions of scarcity increased, hospital, hospitals were filling to capacity with patients whose shared disease meant they all needed the same medications, the same machines, and the same medical care all at the same time. This resulted in a further distribution of risk that made health workers work very different than it had ever been in prior, before that time, before, their, before the virus. These conditions of scarcity also meant that unlike contemporary consumerist models of medicine, where care is based on both medical need and patient preference, in these high capacity settings, patients would get neither the care they needed nor the care they desired because there simply wouldn't be enough to go around. In the face of these challenges, healthcare workers did everything that they could but this sowed the seeds for moral injury. The US's fragmented market-driven healthcare structures have been and still are unable to meet local demand. And with the absence of uh, any sort of national mechanism to co coordinate the moving of patients from an area that's been deluged to one where hospitals have available beds and staff to provide the care, Again, this risk got very large for, the, for health workers in the United States. Let me tell you about one of them. So there's a nurse, she had just left another grueling shift in a COVID unit where she's worked since the first COVID positive patients arrived a lifetime ago. As she's driving home, her path takes her by a local watering hole, and she sees a group of people sort of partying out on the, uh, out on the street corner. As she gets nearer, she notices that they're standing very close together and that none of them are wearing masks. And in that moment, she enters the berserk state. As she's driving, she rolls down her window and begins to scream and shout a litany of unkind things at these strangers. Now, this is a person who does not commonly shout at strangers. In fact, she's never shouted at strangers without provocation from her car as she was driving by them. But the betrayals were too much for her to bear. The first norm she saw being betrayed was that of solidarity which is a group's shared commitment to safety and security. The second norm she saw being, being violated was that of relational autonomy, which is the uh, 
oh, the behaviors of this group demonstrated that they did not care about the fact that their behaviors affected other people's ability to make individual choices. Against this backdrop, her moral horizon shrunk, and in the berserk state, she both violated her personal values and her professional values. Nursing upholds compassion as one of its most high values. These are the healers who pride themselves on treating disease regardless of whether or not it was created by a person's choices. But in the absence of her moral sensibilities, she became a person who was unrecognizable even to herself. Her behaviors unhinged from her values and she didn't care about doing the right thing in that moment. So I see what's in your eyes. You're wondering, how can morally injured people be healed? Or is it even possible? And the great news is, yes, they can. People with moral injuries can absolutely be healed. This is wonderful. Moral injuries can be healed through two things, the communalization of trauma and ethical listening. Trauma becomes communal when people who have been morally injured in similar ways come together and share their experiences. Because the rage and shame are so deep, given their behavior in the berserk state, these stories take on a sacred quality and require a trusted listener. So what kind of listener is required for a person with a moral injury? They require people who are willing and able to be transformed. Now transformation can be small, it can be something as tiny as seeing a light bulb of understanding go on in the listener's head, or it can be big, but what matters most is that the listener has both the will to withstand whatever they're about to hear and the willingness to be transformed by that story. This is part of the reason why traditional approaches may not help people with moral injuries. Therapists of all types learn early in their training to put boundaries up as a protective mechanism to keep them safe from the trauma of others. It's a, pro it's a professional priority to avoid being transformed, and thus such practitioners may not be able to hear someone whose injury requires an, a listener with a different orientation. Lastly, providers are challenged because of that PR problem I mentioned earlier. They, they may possess little to no literacy about moral injury and thus may not know how to approach such a person. So how about the rest of us, those of us who haven't been morally injured in the ways that healthcare workers have. What can we do for those who have so fierce, fearlessly helped us? We can be ethical listeners. The idea of ethical listening dates back to the Stoic philosophers of ancient Rome. Epictetus found that listening in the right way would motivate the speaker to tell their story because it demonstrated the listener's will and willingness to hear it. They were able to tell the tale because you were willing to serve in that role. As a morally injured person, ethical listening can provide an essential element of healing. I hope learning about moral injury has been useful. Maybe there's a time in your own life that you acted in a manner that did not honor your values and dishonored your identity. Maybe learning about this concept can help you reframe that experience and maybe even bring some self-compassion. And while all of us here today have the potential to be morally injured, we all have the opportunity to serve as ethical listeners for those who've experienced a betrayal of what's right by a person in a position of authority in a high-stakes situation.